Method of Prayer by Madame Guillaume, Chapter Twenty Two. One to Six. Distinction between inward and outward acts. In this state, the acts of the soul are inward, but habitual, continued, direct, lasting, deep, simple. Unconscious and resembling a gentle and perpetual sinking into the ocean of divinity. Seven, eight, a comparison. Nine, how to act when we perceive no attraction. Acts are distinguished into external and internal. External acts are those which appear outwardly and bear relation to some sensible object, and have no moral character except such as they derive from the principle from which they proceed. I intend here to speak only of internal acts, those are energies of the soul, by which it turns internally towards some objects, and away. From others. Two. If during my application to God I should form a will to change the nature of my act, I should thereby withdraw myself from God to turn to created objects, and that in a greater or lesser degree according to the strength of the act. And if, when I am turned towards the creature, I would return. To God, I must necessarily form an act, an act for than the purpose. And the more perfect that act is, the more complete is the conversion. Till conversion is perfected, many reiterated acts are necessary. It is with some progressive, though with others it is is tender. Instantaneously, instantaneous, my act, however, should consist in the continual turning to God, the exertion of every faculty and power of the soul purely for Him, agreeably to the instructions of the Psalm of a Shiraz, reunite all the motions. Of the heart, in the holiness of God. Ecclesiastes, thirty, twenty-four. And to the example of、uh, David, I will keep my whole strength for the. Some. I don't know which some it is. I think、uh, that's a fifty. So that's.、Uh, I think it's a fifty. Oh no. It's a hundred. Yeah. Hundred four nine. For we have a street from our heart by sin. It is our heart only that God requires. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eye observe my ways. Proverbs. Um. Fifty-eight. Ah,、uh, no, so twenty-three, twenty-six. I still try to get used to. Um. Get used to. Sorry. Get used to to numbers, Roman numbers. So. Roman numeral count. Anyway, to give the heart to God is to have the whole energy of the soul ever centering in Him, that we may be rendered comfortable, conformable, conformable to His will. We must therefore continue invariably turn to God from our first application to Him. 
but the spirit being unstable. And the soul, accustomed to turn to external objects, is easily distracted. This evil, however, will be counteracted if on、um, perceiving the wandering, we by a pure act return to God, instantly replace ourselves in Him. And this act subsists as long as the conversion lasts. By the powerful influence of a simple and unfeigned return to God. Three. As many reiterated acts form a habit, the soul contracts the habit of conversion, and that act which was before interrupted, the distinct be becomes habitual. The soul should not then. Be perplexed about the forming an act which already subsists, and which indeed it cannot attempt to form without very great difficulty. It even finds that it's withdrawn from its proper state under pretense of seeking that which is in reality acquired. Seeing the habit is already formed, that is confirmed. In habitual conversion and habitual love, it's a seeking one act by the help of many, instead of continuing attached to God by one simple act alone. We may remark that at times we form with facility many distinct acts, simple yet distinct, distinct yet simple acts, which shows that. We have wondered, and that we re-enter our heart after having strayed from it. Yet when we have re-entered, we should remain there in peace. We err, therefore, in supposing that we must not form acts. We form them continually, but let them be conformable to the degree of our spiritual advancement. For. The great difficulty with the most spiritual people arises from their not clearly comprehend comprehending this matter. Now, some acts are transient and distinct; others are continued, and again, some are direct, and others reflective. All cannot form the first; neither are all in a state suited to form the others. The first are dead to those who are who have strayed and who require a distinct exertion, proportion to the extent of their deviation. If the latter be inconsiderable, an act of the most simple kind is su sufficient. Five by the continued act, I mean that、uh, whereby the soul is altogether turned towards God by a direct act, always subsisting. And which does not renew, unless it has been interrupted. The soul being thus returned is in charity and abides therein, and he then dwells in love, dwells in God. First John, four, sixteen. The soul then, as it were, exists and rests in the habitual act. It is, however, free from sloth, for there is still、uh, uninterrupted act subsisting, which is sweet seeking into the deity, whose attraction becomes more and more powerful. Following this potent attraction and dwelling love, the charity, the soul sinks continually deeper into the love, maintaining an activity infinitely more powerful, vigorous. And effectual than that which served to accomplish its first return. Six. Now the soul that is thus profoundly and vigorously active, being wholly given up to God, does not perceive this act, because it is direct and not reflective. This is the reason why some, not expressing themselves properly, say that they make no acts. But it's a mistake, for they were never. More truly or nobly active, they should say that they did not distinguish their acts, and not that they did not act.
Granted that they do not act in themselves, but they are drawn to follow the attraction. Love is the weight which sinks them. As one falling to the sea would sink from one depth to another to all eternity. If the sea were infinite, so they, without perceiving their descent, drop with inconceivable swiftness into the lowest deeps. It is an improper to say that we do not make acts or form acts, but the manner of their formation is not alike in all. The mistake arises from this that all who know they should act are desirous of acting distinguishably and、uh, percept- perceptibly, but this cannot be. Sensible acts are for beginners. Yeah, <laughs> there are others for those in a more advanced state. To stop in the former, which are weak and of a little profit, is to declare ourselves the lander, and to tempt the lander without having passed through the former. Is a no less considerable error. Not a good observation. Wonderful. Seven. To everything there is a, a season. Ecclesiastes three one. Every state has its commencement, its progress, its consummation. It is an unhappy error to stop in the beginning. There is no art, but what has is a progress. And at first we labor with toil, but last we reap the fruit of our industry. When the vessel is in port, the mariners are obliged, ob- obliged to obliged to exert all their strength, and they may clear then, clear her thence and put to sea, but they subsequently turn her with the facility and the place, in like a manner, while、uh, the soul remains in sin. And the creature, many endeavors are requisite to effect its freedom. The cables which hold it must be loose, and then by strong and vigorous efforts, the gathers its inroad, pushes off gradually from the old port itself, and、uh, leaving that behind, proceeds to the interior, the heaven, so much desired. Eight. When the vessel is thus started, as she advances on the sea, she leaves the shore behind, and the further she departs from the land, the less labor is requisite in moving her forward. At length, she begins to get gently under sail, and now proceeds with so swiftly in her course that the oars, which are become useless, are laid aside. How is the pilot now? Employed, he's content with spreading the sails and holding the rudder. To spread the sails is to lay ourselves before God in the prayer of a simple exposition, to be moved by His Spirit. To hold the rudder is to restrain our heart from wandering from the true course, recalling it gently and guiding it steadily by the dictates of the Spirit of God, which. Gradually gains possession of the heart. The sand the breeze by degrees fills the sails and impels the vessel. But the wind affairs the pilot and the mariners rest from their labors. What progress do they not now secure without the least fatigue? They make more way now in one number while they rest and lead the vessel to the wind than they did in the length of time by all the former efforts. And even were they now to attempt using the oars, besides greatly fatiguing themselves, they would only retard the vessel by their useless exertions. This is our proper course interiorly, and a short time will advance us by the divine impulsion further than many reiterated acts of exertion. Whoever will try this path will find it. The easiest is in the world. Nine. If the wind be contrary and blow a storm, we must cast anchor in the sea to hold the vessel. This anchor is simply trusting God and hoping His goodness, waiting patiently, the coming of the tempest and the return of a favorable gale. Thus did David. I waited patiently 
for the Lord, and they inclined unto me, and I heard my cry. Uh, I guess it's a forty-one, Psalm forty-one. We must therefore be resigned to the Spirit of God, giving ourselves up wholly to His divine guidance.